Welcome if there is any new member amid um, stars. If there is any new member who is visiting us for the first time or you've come in to after a while, please feel most welcome. We appreciate your choosing or rather your choice to come on fellowship with us this afternoon. And we trust that the Lord is going to bless us all together in his presence. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Corinthians. First Corinthians, we continue with our journey. The first Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one. Today we are focusing on verse from verse 17 to verse 25. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 17 to 25. I will read for us from the English Standard Version, ESV. This is what the word, of the, the word of the Lord says. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 22. The Jews demand science and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentile. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The last one, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. May God bless his word. We began our journey of the book of Corinthians last week, and in the last week, we shared under the great topic, the great topic, the church life, and we looked at the identity of the church in itself in the last week. And in the last week, as we shared about the identity of the church, we said that the church is called by God. It belongs to God. And we ran through and we saw how God called the, called the church to belong to him. And we say that the church is the group of members, individual members, who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. And we explained through the word sanctification, and we looked at three main aspects which are depicted in the sanctification process. And we say that in this sanctification, God has made a people, a holy people for himself. That he has purified us, he has made us blameless. Each one of us who belong to the church, he has made us blameless and holy. Though we were filth and sinners in his presence, he has chosen to make us holy and blameless in Christ Jesus. And also we looked under the aspect of, uh, under the element of sanctification, we said that we have been set apart. We've been sanctified, made holy and pure, belonging to God, and we've been set apart, separated from other people of the world. We went through back to Deuteronomy, I mean Exodus 19, and we saw how God chose the children of Israel and said that, though the whole world is mine, I've chosen you to belong to me as special people. And therefore the Lord has sanctified us, has made us pure, and he has set us apart, different from other people, and he has made us to be a holy people belonging to him. And under the same, uh, same element of sanctification, 
we say that it has the third aspect, which is being set apart for a purpose. We've been sanctified, made holy, blameless and pure before God by his own power and his own love for us. And he has separated us from the world, other people. We are not just ordinary people like other people out there, but he has set us apart. And then he has not just set us apart for nothing, but as a church, he has set us apart for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And we share together and we say that wherever the Lord has put us to dwell there, in the designated places where God has specifically made us to live, made us to work, made us to operate in different spheres of life, there is the place where God has given us specific purposes to do, to carry out. And we profoundly mention that the purpose is God has, the purpose God has given to us is basically make him known within our regions. And having called us to belong to him, we looked at another uh, identity of the church and we say that the church, the church having been called belonging to God, the church is a group of individuals, the members who have been sent into the world to carry on these particular purposes and they have been given resources. They have been empowered. They have been empowered by being given gifts that the Lord has given to us to carry out these specific purposes that he has given to us. And then we looked at the third aspect, the, the church is the group of individuals whom God has taken the responsibility of sanctifying them and keeping them holy by himself and his power. Praise God. Those are the identity of the church that we saw last time. Now, today we're moving on under the same big title of the life of a church, or rather church life, through the book of Corinthians. And now today we're moving on on the title, The Message of the Cross being the power and the wisdom of God for our salvation. One thing we need to bear in mind as we move on is that when we talk about the church, the Lord of the scripture is talking about individual persons, each one of us being members of this body of Christ, members whom Christ live in us, we become part of the church of God. And therefore, as we run through this, we need to identify ourselves as being a church whom Christ dwell in us. Praise God. So we are going to be using this uh, identity of the church, referring to individual believers, at the same time referring the community of the believers as we are here on, in OEM and in the universal sphere at large. Now, having introduced, having given the introduction in the preceding verses that we read in the last week, Paul is now moving on to begin addressing the problems within the Church of Corinth. Remember I said that the Church of Corinth is an ideal church that was thriving in its relationship with God, its relationship within the members themselves, and the relationship with the world outside there. So Paul now moves on to begin addressing the problems which are being depicted within this congregation. And uh, the problems that we're going to be experiencing throughout the text, throughout the book of Corinthians, are majorly uh, engulfed into fourfold feature, or rather they appear in four main elements. The very first element there is that the church is having quarrels it is experiencing quarrels amidst themselves. And these quarrels are basically founded in the notion of wisdom. These quarrels that are going on in the notion of wisdom, as you're going to see ahead, they are making them to divide, to have divisions amongst themselves, identifying themselves with specific teachers or other ministers who had ministered with I mean, among them, some of them having particular qualities of which others weren't exposing. Others were very eloquent in their speech. 
others had high level of the wisdom, or rather the, ex the exposed high level of knowledge as they were ministering to them, and others had different talents within them. Therefore, these Corinthians congregation, they were looking at these teachers who had ministered within them, and they were comparing them and say, oh, so-and-so is much better than so-and-so. So-and-so is much better than so-and-so. Specifically, they had three main teachers who had ministered among them. The first one was Paul, as we shared in the introduction. Paul founded the church, and then after having founded the church, when he had ministered there for a while, another minister came in, Apollos. Apollos came in, as you can find in the book of Acts chapter 18. Apollos came in and joined Paul, and then Paul ministered with Apollos for a short time, and Paul moved on to Ephesus and left Apollos behind. Now, Apollos was a little bit different. He was gifted different from how Paul was. For Apollos, he was a very eloquent man. He was good at speech. He, was, he had been trained in the Greek, or uh, I mean, uh, Greek uh, rhetoric expressions. So you like eloquently share the gospel different, or rather comparatively differently from how Paul could do it. Now the Christians, having had a minister of Apollos, they will compare Paul and Apollos and say, Paul is much, I mean, Paul is much lesser gifted than Apollos is. Another minister who came to minister among his them was Peter, the so-called Cephas. Cephas came and ministered to them from Jerusalem, and Peter had this favor, or rather the crown of being among the first apostles of Jesus Christ. Remember, Peter was together with Jesus, he walked with Jesus, but Paul did not walk with Jesus physically, right? So, the believers in Corinth, they were like, Peter has had an experience with Jesus. He speaks exactly what he had from Jesus. But Paul, he only had vision. He speaks out of the visions he had with Jesus. And I think Peter is more powerful when it comes to the gospel than what Paul teaches. So these differences, as they were comparing their teachers, made some schisms within them, minus them. They had divisions. And some began dividing and claiming, as you can see in verse 12, claiming, oh, I belong to Peter because Peter is a powerful apostle of Jesus. Others are like, oh, we belong to Paul. Paul is the one who first preached to us and we became Christians because of what Paul preached to us. You cannot despise Paul because he is our founder. And others are like, hey, man, wait. Apollos is so eloquent. He speaks so profoundly. You see the way he explains the gospel. So we belong to this. So they had some clustering among us themselves. Paul comes in and he gets to hear about all this. And then he sees this problem and its detrimental nature on the power of the gospel itself. That the Corinthians were deviating away from holding on the fundamental truth of the gospel, but embracing the wisdom of man, comparing their teachers based on the human evaluation and forget about the basics or rather the fundamental truth of the gospel. The fundamental truth of the gospel, which is embedded in the unity of one body amid its diversity. Paul tells them, he begins, he opens, his, uh, he, he opens his writing by declaring to them that you should agree with each other. This is what he says. We go back a bit on the verse 12 there. On verse 10, when he opens that section, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you, Agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let me begin by explaining a little bit here, though it's not the, air, the, the section I wanted to concentrate on. But let me speak it out. When I was reading these, I was like, do you really want to talk about it? 
I don't want to talk about it. I'm not comfortable talking about this, knowing that I'm just a new member who is coming in to inherit somebody's responsibility, somebody who has been there before. Anyways, I thank God because you're preaching the serious preaching, and I can cover myself under that umbrella and say that that's what the word says. But uh, this is what the word says. The thing is that all of us, we are on pilgrimage. We are, we are like sojourners. The Bible uses the word sojourners. We are all moving on as human beings. We live here one time, we move on to another place. We move on to another place. That is our nature. More especially the OEM, our English ministry, we are not permanent members of this place. And the Lord is going to expose us to different shepherds, to different ministers. <laughs> and whenever we gather before the presence of the Lord, this is my conviction that God is love for his people, the church, is much greater than the love he has even for the minister himself. That there is a way the Lord will release his blessings over his people just because they've gathered together. There is a way the Lord in his divine power ministers to the members of the congregation who've gathered in his name in different and unique ways. Therefore, whenever we gather under whatever minister that the Lord has raised to minister to us in any situation, in any setting, let us always listen to what the word speaks to us, what the Lord speaks to us. Don't mind about who is speaking about it. I have had to sit before different ministers, and uh, I speak this out of my challenge as a person in myself. You know, of course, the ministry of uh, Pastorship, it's my profession, I will, I will say so. It's my calling and a profession because I've been trained in that. And now quite often, whenever I sit under somebody's, somebody's message, or rather somebody sharing the message, my question is usually like, hmm, I think theologically is not right. I think theologically he would have done like this. I think he would have spoken this. I think he would have spoken. I think you people might have been exposed to this. Like when somebody, who is within the area of your profession where you've been trained, is risen up, or rather he has been given the responsibility to act on a particular day where we have to sit down and be ministered by that particular person. It could be in different professions. And wherever the very first thing comes in in our minds is like, ah, oh, no, he's not doing right there. I think you said, we would have done like this, we would have done like that. And quite often, we easily get swayed off from what is being addressed and we remain with the critics to the minister who is ministering. I like to share this to us, not because I want you to, not because I'm asking for being accepted among stars, but I'm sharing this because the Lord will raise different ministers to minister to us in different settings. It could be in our Bible studies. It could be in different churches where we go. But whenever the Lord rises an individual to minister to us, let us look at the message which the Lord speaks to us. Because whenever we gather, he releases his message for us. Amen. <laughs> let me talk about myself. I am a human being. I, for person, I regard this as a growing opportunity. Any opportunity God gives me for the ministry is a growing opportunity. And I thank God that he has gifted me to the extent that I'm very much objective and open enough because I want to grow. And at any time, please, don't hesitate to speak into my life. Right? For me, I may be different from other ministers. I know in our settings, in our settings, we have ministers are here, and the congregation is a little bit here. We, have, we kind of have to pay a lot of respect, and, uh, which is necessary because the culture is given to us. But I, for one, 
I look at this as a platform God has given me to grow together as a family, to grow into becoming a minister in his kingdom by his grace. And therefore, for me, I'm very open. Whenever there is an issue you want to share with a minister, with me, please come and tell me. I'm very open. Mm -hmm. I'm very much open. That is me. And I speak it out of my heart. I'm open to critics that will help me to grow mm. as a life. I've shared with them, some of us that please speak to me because I want to grow. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. I say that when I say praise God, please respond with amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to grow. Anyways, let's get back to the scripture. Paul tells them, that you are accepting to evaluate your ministers on the grounds of your human wisdom is swaying you from the gospel foundations. And he precautions them and he tells them, agree together. Agree together in one mind, in one spirit, one mind of the gospel, one mind of the spirit, I mean, one opinion in the spirit of the foundations of the cross. When Paul tells them to agree together, he does not tell them that you have to be unified together. No. He tells them that though there are differences among you, but for the sake of the cross, you have to be speaking one voice. Because the cross is the only fundamental foundation of our salvation. Not of the teachers. Not of the philosophical influences that you're living in, but the power of the cross that God has given, it is the only foundation of our salvation. Now, the basic thing there that is being appearing, beside the quarrels that are going on on the basis of uh, aligning with various teachers, the church is also going through a lot of uh, a lot of boasting. The members are boasting with the qualifications that they had in the aspect of knowledge and wisdom that they had acquired, or rather, had been opportuned to be to experience. What was going on there, as we shall see down there, is that in this very first century. There was the famous notion, or rather famous wave of learning and excelling in philosophical thinking and philosophical education, basically known as Hellenistic education. People were being trained in the Greek culture kind of education, and people were being learned, being, getting learned, and becoming so powerful in the areas of their learning. And among us, the congregation of the believers in Corinth, we have these who are also well nourished in the Greek philosophical education. And through these acquisitions that they had, they were kind of puffing and boasting up. Boasting up in a way that they began interpreting or understanding the message of the gospel in these philosophical ideologies, mythical beliefs, and all that. And they were looking at themselves as being more powerful with knowledge and despising others who are not very well eloquent in those areas. And then finally, the number four point was that the church was having the problem of rejecting Paul. Looking at Paul, comparing him with his other, with his other teachers, the two teachers, they were like, Paul has never been with Jesus Christ. Though he founded the church, he was not one of the 12 disciples. When he comes around us, he doesn't even speak with eloquence or philosophical wisdom. Do you think he's an apostle? So they were like denying his apostleship over them because he was measuring a little lower. His standard was a little lower than what their standards as human beings were. Now Paul sees this. And he pinpoints out the specific problem that is causing all these schisms and the problems that the church is experiencing. And he mentions it out and tells them, you should desist from embracing the worldly wisdom. You should desist from embracing the wisdom of men 
and compare your ministers upon this, compare the gospel upon this wisdom of man. Now let us a little bit look at what this wisdom of man was all about. The wisdom of man has a little bit shared in the beginning. The wisdom of man that is being referred over here was all about the Greek high philosophical education that was going on within the region during this first century and uh, the Jewish belief in the Messianic pro promise and their uh, devotion to the law. This specific wisdom of man was not in line with what the scripture was teaching about the message of the cross because the wisdom of man was not directing people to salvation. The wisdom of men that Paul is referring to had some negative effects on the gospel and the church in itself. Because one, it attempted to find salvation in its own rationalized human thinking. Back to the philosophical understanding, the philosopher of the time, more especially from a mention one, that was the school of Platonism. Plato, as uh, some of us might have uh, read about him, he is very much renowned of his, uh, of his idea of reincarnation, life after death. Of course, Christians, we believe that. And Plato, in his teaching about life after death, he said that the human souls are immortal. Our souls live beyond our temporal material. And the way they live beyond our temporal material, then how they're going to live the status of our soul when we die from the earth is dependent on how we are living today, which is right. Christianity teaches so. But then he said that how we're going to live, how our souls are going to live after we've died is dependent on if we did good things, our souls are going to reincarnate. Our souls are going to be rebirth, reborn, in something which is more better, of higher value. And if at all, we did bad things, or rather evil things, our souls are going to be reborn in something of low quality. For example, let me think about myself. I don't know if I'm good enough or bad enough. Maybe I would be, if I died according to Plato, if I died today, maybe I would be born into a cat or a bird. <laughs> Uh, a, a cat is a little bit better. I think I'm a little bit better than maybe I'll be born into a cat or something of the kind. I'm just kidding. So the teachings of the time water, how you live today is going to determine how you're going to be, your soul is going to be reborn in the future. So if you led a bad life today, maybe your soul is going to be reborn into a tree or your soul is going to be born into a bird or your soul is going to be born into a human being who is ugly or something of the kind. But the Christians were now being influenced by this. And now, what was going on was that people with this philosophical teaching, they were believing that I can prepare to live a better life after I die by striving to live a moral, upright life today. Closely, if you look at this closely, you realize that this premise is quite closer to the Christian teaching. The Christian teaching of living a holy life and blameless life. Not so. But when Christians and the philosophers were embracing this, they were not counting on the power of God, the divine power of God, in enabling people to live a blameless life. The thing was that, they were teaching people to have moral virtues, moral virtues that deceive from committing evil, or rather walking evil ways, but believing in their own ability, striving by their own power to live morally upright so that in the future, or rather when they pass on, they will live, they will be reborn into a better thing. Now Christians in Corinth, having been influenced with these Ideolo ideological teaching, philosophical ideological teachings around their world, 
they begin interpreting the scripture and say that we ought to strive, we can strive to live a better life. We can live a better life and they were committing into what we may look at as being legalism, striving, believing in our own human power to live a better life so that our relationship probably with God will be better. Get me right? And then, at the same time, having been influenced with those teachings, we also had a lot of, during this time, we had a lot of the philosophical teachers, we call them peripatetic teachers, who were moving around and teaching these philosophical ideologies to people. They would gather people in marketplaces and teach them about these moral uprights. They would gather them in, in uh, gymnastics and teach them about how to be good people. They would gather them into uh, stadiums and all that and so on. And then, like, these teachers were very gifted in rhetoric approach in teaching. Very gifted. So, the Corinthians who were also sitting under their teachings in their marketplaces, having heard them, they were now comparing them with their teachers. And but at the same time, deviating from the basic teachings of the gospel. But then, this was washing down the salvation given truly by the grace of God in the message of salvation. And as such, with those human, I mean, human wisdom teachings, the power and the magnitude, or rather the ability, the efficacy of the cross was being washed away. Like people do not specifically need the cross for them to live better life. We don't really need the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for us to live a better life, but we can strive with the philosophical teachings and live a moral upright life and then better our tomorrow when we've gone through our earthly life. The philosophers of the time, as you're gonna see in our second session, section there, with this kind of influence, of the human ability to better our lives, they were seeing no need of salvation by the grace of God. And they were looking at the as being fully, as I'm going to be explaining there later. And all this human wisdom in general, as Paul says when we read verse 21, they could not earn human being salvation at all. Because people will be taught about moral uprights, but they could never meet to the standard of the moral uprightness in and itself. They taught about the outward behavior, outward acting, but the inward cause that influences the outward acting was never touched by these moral teachings. So in that case, salvation or other men could never be able to attain the salvation that God required out of them. For the elaboration at, uh, at the, or rather elaboration on the reference of the wisdom that Paul talks about here, in verse 23, let us look at verse 23 together. Can we turn to verse 23 together and we see what Paul says? <coughs> Excuse me. This is what he says. But we preach, the, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. What Paul preaches, he says that what we are preaching is a stumbling block to who? To the Jews mm -hmm. and folly to the Gentiles. The Gentiles here is referring to the Greek high philosophical thinking. And the folly here is referring to the Jewish high commitment to the law, the Torah message, and the promise of the Messiah who was going to come. In this case, the Greeks themselves, in their pride, they found it very hard to comprehend the element, or rather the assertion, that a God could be crucified on the cross. 
Of course, remember, as I told you in the beginning, that this region of the great Mediterranean region was highly influenced with a lot of other religions. And Greeks, including the Romans, and the entire members who were living in the, that region, they had other gods, and they believed that gods were immortal. They could never die. Now, when Jesus Christ comes in, and he preaches the gospel, or rather the message of the good news of the kingdom, and the people begin believing in him and follow him, and then eventually, at the end of it all, Jesus gets on Calvary and he dies on the cross. Greeks are like, what a minute. How can you believe in a person who claimed to be God and he dies? What kind of a God is that? So Greeks were looking at this and saying, this is mere a folly thing. It's not true. This is just a scandal. You ought not to be believing in that. And therefore, inviting the Greeks to believe in Jesus Christ, you really had to convince them at a great deal. And now with this kind of philosophical teachings, the Corinthians were now embracing this, and it comes to Paul, and Paul is like, come on, you people. You're embracing the wisdom of the people who criticize the so-called religion you believe in. They don't believe in the crucifixion of a God. They're like, which God can be crucified? And they regard your crucifixion as being folly, as being scandalous. You cannot embrace their wisdom in your understanding the gospel because it will definitely wash down the message of the gospel. He moves on and tells them that for the Greeks, when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, to them, they looked at Jesus Christ's death on the cross as the death of a criminal. Because we understand that the death on the cross was only a penalt that was designated for the chief criminals of the government, Roman government. Nobody would be crucified on the cross unless he was a, a terrible criminal. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross as such, to the Gentiles and all the non-believers, they regarded him as a <coughs> criminal. And then come to the Jewish people. The Jewish people looked at it as a person who is cursed. Because for the Jews, they believed that a person who is hung is a cursed person. Now, Jesus to the Jews was a cursed fella. And when Christianity began at the beginning, the entire region of Mediterranean thought that Christianity is part of the Jewish religion. Now, when Jesus Christ was crucified at the end of it all, that's when Christianity began being distinguished from the Judaism. And Jews felt it so embarrassing and shameful to be identified with Christians. Because Jesus Christ, who is regarded as a cursed person within their region by his being cast or rather hanged on the cross was being claimed to be a god by the Christians. And then beside that, you know, Christians, I mean, the Jewish people were the, the monotheist believers. They believed in one god. And this god cannot come in to be a physical being and die on the cross as such. And therefore, they were denying the cross. They were like, no, we can't believe the cross because that is only shameful and disgraceful to us. Beyond that, the Jews, in the promise that was given to them, they had this historic promise of Messiah who is going to come. And they had a, big, a different picture that was painted about the Messiah who is going to come. They knew that the Messiah who is going to come is going to be a political leader, and he's going to restore the righteousness. He's going to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus Christ comes in in a very humble picture. Very humble picture that does not meet the standard of a Messiah that the Jewish people expected. And then when they hear about him being lifted as being God, the son of God, they're like, no, this is a stumbling block to us. We can't hold on that. Remember in Matthew, somewhere in Matthew, 
Let me get it right. It should be Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, they met Jesus. And when they met Jesus, yes, Matthew chapter 11, verse 18 and to 31. When the Jews met Jesus, they asked him, which sign are you going to do for us? So that we may know that you are the Messiah sent by God. What are they looking for? They are looking for a Messiah who is going to be exalted. They are looking for a Messiah who is going to deliver them out of their polit political problems. They are lo looking for a Messiah who is going to restore the glory of the Israel as a nation. But when Christ comes in, he comes in in a total different picture. That's why Paul declares in verse 21 to 22 and says that God has chosen to bring, to use his folly, what is being regarded as folly to the Jewish, to the Greeks, and what is being regarded as stumbling block to the Jewish people. And this is the means which he has chosen to save the world. <clears throat> the means of humility, being humiliated on the cross, the means of being rejected, the means of being regarded as a cast fellow. But it is the way that the Lord has chosen to do it. And to the Jews, it is regarded as a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's regarded as folly. But yet, this is the power and the wisdom of God. That's why today when I was reading this, I felt like we share a little bit about the wisdom and the power of the cross. The cross, rather, the cross as being the power and the wisdom of God. Paul talks about the message of the cross. And he says that the wisdom of men waters away the power of the message of the cross. Because the wisdom of men tends to make men to seek self-sustainability or the self-sustainings they look at themselves as being able to sustain their lives today and their lives tomorrow independent of God. The wisdom of man leads people away from their dependence on God. The wisdom of man makes people feel no need of God, no need of trust in God, other than trust in the qualities and the abilities they have by themselves. The wisdom of man tends to make an utopia kingdom of their own self without caring about what the Lord says to them. This wisdom of men, as we concluded, we say that it will never earn salvation to the people. Because even after God having given them all this wisdom, exposed his revelation through the natural ways, as Paul says in the book of Romans chapter chapter 1 verse 20 to 25 that God has made known about himself through nature to the people that people may come to know him but men even with their wisdom they will never attain the salvation standards of God after men having failed to achieve the standards of God God himself chooses to bring in his own way of saving human beings the message of the cross the message of the cross in itself, as Paul presents it, it is the revelation of God. Revelation of God in his gracious power to help or rather save the helpless human beings. Helpless and desperate human beings who are in need of his salvation. In Romans, as I said, in Romans chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 20, 25, I'll read for us. Paul says this, that for since the creation of the world, God is invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been, early, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Glory, were darkened, sorry. Although they claimed to be wise, 
they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over into the sinful desire of their hearts to sexual moralities for the degre degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchange the truth about God for lie and worship and served created beings rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. The God made everything that ought to be known about him clear to them. That is what Paul calls the wisdom of God. In verse 21, Paul says that God made in his wisdom, he made it known to the people. But people even despite the wisdom that God had given to them, by made, displaying his universal immense power of creation, people could still not be able to achieve the revelation that he has given to them. And then out of that, he decides to bring in what appears to be folly to them, so that through this folly, the message of the cross will bring salvation to the people. Now, having looked at that, we consider the message of the cross as Paul brings it. And Paul declares it out in verse 18 that the message of the cross is God's gracious power. God's gracious power for the salvation of people. In verse 18 and verse 21, then down to 24, he speaks about that. That it is out of this message of the cross that salvation has come to men who are helpless. This power of God has saved men and granted them what they could never have had. As we looked back in the last Sunday in verse 2, we saw that in his power he has brought salvation which has made people holy. He has cleansed people, and he has sanctified us, and he has won people, made a church that belongs to him through this power of the gospel. This is the power that has sanctified us. This is the power that has made us holy. This is the power that has made us blameless and that has brought us to be worthy people as a church in the presence of God. The message of the cross is the power that brought us into this great fellowship with Christ Jesus. The power in which we find our existence, the power in which we find our sustainability. We've been sustained in this purity of the fellowship with the Lord by the power of the message of the gospel. In verse, nine, verse 8 to verse 9, Paul says that, God is faithful and is able to sustain us in Jesus Christ until his appearance next time. How does he do this? He sustains you and I as a church by the power that is embedded in the message of the cross. The power that is embedded in the message of the cross is not that I can do it by myself, but the power claims and say that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I have been made holy. Because he lives by the message of the cross, I have been sustained in him. Beside being the power that saves and sanctifies, Paul declares and says that the message of the cross is the unfathomable wisdom of God. And for them, we in a manner that as human beings, we can't comprehend it all together. We can all add it all together into our rational of thinking and understanding. And that's why Greeks could not understand it, and they referred it as being folly. And that's why the Jews could not understand it and termed it as stumbling block. Because for the Jews, they knew that with the way God has introduced, I mean, revealed himself to them, they knew that. They have to commit themselves to the keeping the Torah law, and without keeping the Torah law, if you fault them, then definitely you are doomed to hell. You can see God. You cannot relate with Yahweh if you break the Torah. That's what the Jewish people knew about it. But the message of the cross 
comes in in a way, in a wisdom of God himself, which cannot be understood about human beings. What is this wisdom about that Paul refers in this case? The wisdom of God, it is embedded in his choice of humiliating cross. That God chose not to bring a Messiah in this lofty appearance, in the bigger figure that the Jewish expected. He chose to bring in salvation to men, not in this philosophical thinking that the Greeks embraced, not thinking and contemplating about nature to acquire salvation of men as the philosophers embraced. But it is in the wisdom of God himself, the way he chose it, that the cross has to be the best and the ultimate sufficient way where men have to be saved. Why the cross? That is the mystery that the Greeks never understood, the mystery that the Jewish never understood, and the mystery that many people, even within our contemporary world, never understood, never understand even today. The wisdom of God in the cross. God, in his wisdom, he chooses to reincarnate, I mean, to incarnate himself, to become a human being, live a holy and a blameless life within people, and then ascends to the cross as a pure sacrifice that meets his righteous requirement and yet pay the righteous penalty that human beings could never acquire. That is the secret of the message of the cross that the Jewish people never understood. This is the secret of the message of the cross that the Jewish people never understood. And when he ascended on the cross, he declares that it's all finished. It is all finished that men have been set free. That a nation, a family, a church has been acquired to God. A group of people who were not worthy in the presence of God, those who were in the category of the accursed people, are now declared to be the people of God who are blameless. Praise God. That is the wisdom in his wise way that he chose. He chose to bring in himself, incarnate and live within people, live in this humble status in a humiliating way and embrace the cross which is regarded by the Romans as the cast and the penalty of death. He brings in the cross which is regarded by the Greeks as stupidity in the scandalous way of raising a God. He brings in the cross which is being regarded as a cursed way of killing people to the Jewish people, so that no human being will boast in the salvation. Praise God. Mm -hmm. So that there will be a transfer of power. But those who come in, they won't have to strive by themselves to stay in there but he himself will sustain them, as he says in verse 8 and verse 9. So that the message of the cross comes in as the gracious power of God that cleanses us, purifies us, sanctifies us every day, and maintains us in him. So that the message of the cross will be the wisdom of God and the foolishness of man, or rather what men look at as being foolish, so that those who come in will by faith experience this power of the cross by depending on him, by trusting in him with a simple faith. Praise God. Does this message of the cross still work today? Yes. The message of the cross is still alive. The message of the cross is still able. The message of the cross is still powerful. If you and I can take it by faith, it's still vividly powerful working in the lives of men. He was, he is, he is to come with the power of this cross that he took on over 2,000 years ago. Praise God. 
That is the solid fundamental truth that Paul tells the Corinthians. That you don't have to philosophize the message of the cross, it waters it down. You don't have to reason out the message of the cross, but take it the way it has come and experience the power of the message of the cross. Is wisdom wrong? No, it's not wrong. Is the wisdom and the knowledge of the world wrong? No, it's not wrong. But the wisdom and the knowledge of the world that displaces the power of the cross, then it's the way that deviates people away from God. Praise God. It's the way that drives people away from God. Because it poses questions to God. It poses questions to the means of salvation that God has given. But to those who believe it, as Paul says, that to those who are believing it, the message of the cross is the power of God that saves us, the power of God that purifies us, the power of God that cleanses us. It is the wisdom of God by which if we learn to depend in Him, Trust in Him with all our lives, with all our mind. Our victory of existence is found there. The hope of the future is found there. Our victory to overcome is found there. Everything we need, as He said in in verse nine, uh, in verse seven, that in Him we have found everything we need we've been accessed into immense blessings and the gifts to be sustained in his purity and righteousness that is the word of the lord praise god so god has loved us and god has in his love in his wisdom and power given us salvation through the message of the cross as we trust in him as we trust his word it is still true the word is living, the word is guiding, is a life and power into our lives. It speaks about it in John chapter 17. You get that in John chapter 17 when he's praying for the church. He prays for the church and he tells Father, sanctify them in your word. Because your word is true. Your word purifies. What is the word he's talking about? John chapter 1 speaks about Jesus Christ as being the word. He says, in the beginning, there was the word, and the word was in God. Who is this word? Jesus Christ. He who dwells in us is our daily sanctifier. He who dwells in us is our daily purifier. He who dwells in us is our daily sustainer in our fellowship with the Father. And he accesses us into the blessings of the Lord. Shall we embrace the message of the cross? Shall we hold on it? Cling on it? It is our salvation. It's all that we need. As you roll down, I want us to sing this song together. Uh, this hymn on the ragged cross. Ragged cross sung by George Barnard. Michelle, please come and help me out. We will rise up together as we sing this song confess that we shall cling on that ragged cross. Michelle, hurry up, please. <laughs>
to reveal yourself to us and call us, O Lord, to this great privilege of life in eternity, the cross that saves us, the cross that wins us to be yours, the cross that sanctifies us, O the cross that purifies us every day after another one, the cross our hope, the cross our strength, the cross our tomorrow, the cross our victory. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you've chosen to save each one of us, Lord, and call us, my Father, each one of us by your name. Giving us your name, O Lord, that we are yours. We thank you, Lord. And Father, as we sung in your presence, we pray the Lord you grant it. Granted, Lord, that we will cherish the ragged cross. That we will cherish the message of the cross, Lord, and experience its power. Help us, Lord, to have faith, Lord, to trust in your word. For the cross is Christ living in us. Christ living in us and who has given us his word, who speaks to us. Father, we pray that give us faith to believe in your word. Give us faith to trust your word, O oh God even beyond our understanding. But whenever you say, may we trust it. For your word is true. Your word is power. Your word yet is loving. We thank you. Submit ourselves to you. We thank you for your word, O oh God. Seal it into our lives. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. 